Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Villa Maria College and Listen, Learn, Act, Education's Role in Combating Racism and Violence. Thank you for attending this special conversation tonight. My name is Brian Emerson. I'm one of the vice presidents here at the college. I'd like to give just a quick housekeeping introduction and then I'll turn it over to our hosts uh, for this evening's panel discussion. Uh, there are restrooms located in, in the back of the room as well as behind the stage. Uh, if you are in need of an accessible exit uh, tonight, uh, we ask that you use the side of the stage here and our uh, staff out in the foyer can help you as well. If you'd like to ask a question tonight during the Q&A portion uh, of the conversation, we ask that you visit villa.edu slash listen and submit your question on the form located right there. And you can get to it from your smartphone. Uh, again, thank you. And I'd like to now welcome uh, Mr. David Russ, the Executive Director of Say Yes Buffalo, uh, to give our introduction. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dave Rust with Say Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, by start this by thanking Villa Maria College under the leadership of Dr. Giordano uh, and Zanetta Heverart from Senator Kennedy's office for hosting this really important discussion. Uh, I appreciate your leadership and the time that you've decided to put into this this evening. Um, I thought I would open a little bit with, with how we got here this evening. Um, so Say Yes Buffalo was formed over a decade ago, uh, and one of our key membership bodies has been an operating committee that we've pulled together focused on educational attainment for students in the city of Buffalo, the signature component of that being a scholarship promise that we've had for graduates of the public and charter schools for everyone. Um, after May 14th, uh, we were scheduled to uh, have interviews for a modern youth apprenticeship program, which we had launched. And what we had heard from the students that there was unspeakable trauma coming forward. In our body, which we meet regularly with leadership from SUNY Erie, Buffalo State College, Madai, Villa Maria, uh, the city of Buffalo under the mayor's leadership, the county executive, the superintendent's office, parent leadership, philanthropy, union leadership. Um, we felt that we needed to pull people together to hear about what was going on, that things weren't okay, and that there really was no going back to normal. Uh, so we hosted a discussion uh, with a number of students uh, from the public schools and those that are working to support students and staff in the public schools um, at our office. Uh, we hosted that in mid-July. Uh, and it was a, a rich discussion about the support that students need, about those that are trying to assist students, what they're going through, and the support they need in working, and uh, what, they, we need, that what they needed us to hear so that we can all do better in supporting students as we were returning to a new school year. Um, it was equally important to hear from students and also those employed by all the institutions and student supports about how we can do better, uh, in particular given uh, the race of shooting that was witnessed at TOPS. That was devastating and, and hard for many to recover from. Uh, so after that, uh, President Giordano called and said that he would like to host a similar forum for an audience here at Villa for everybody to hear about this and have a chance to listen, learn, and act. So we appreciate you taking some time to listen, learn, and act on this rainy evening. Uh, it's an important discussion, and I know everyone's going to learn a lot from those that are willing to share their words tonight and the questions from our respondents. So without further ado, I will turn it to our two hosts for this evening, President Giordano and Zanetta Everhart. Thank you, David, thank you. Um, my name is Zanetta Everhart. I am Director of Diversity and Inclusion for New York State Senator Tim Kennedy. And I am also Zaire's mom. Um, my son, Zaire Goodman, was shot and seriously injured on 514 in the massacre at the Topps grocery store on Jefferson. Um, and thank you all uh, for being here with us today. And thank you to Senator Kennedy, Dave Rust, and all the Say Yes partners, the Oshai Foundation, everyone here, of course, um, our distinguished respondents. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, and especially our panelists. Um, the students and educators here today, thank you um, for being here. It really, really takes courage um, to do this, and we appreciate it. And thank you as well. I'm Matt Giordano. I'm the president of Villa Maria College, and uh, just really, really happy to have this discussion and to have all of you here. Uh, and I just want to make mention of where we are right now. 
So Villa, uh, you know, we're kind of tucked away in this neighborhood. The city line goes right through our campus. So we're sitting in Chictawaga right here. You walk a few steps uh, to uh, the uh, west and you are in the city of Buffalo. So that's important because this community was primarily a Polish community for a long time, but it has changed a lot and it is a very diverse community right now. Uh, and I think it's a, a good nexus point for having these kinds of conversations because all of the issues that we're going to be talking about tonight uh, are kind of represented in the history of this community that we're in. White flight, immigration, increasing diversity. So um, one of the things we want to get to in our conversation is just what we know about the community we live in and how that history and knowledge is really important for all of us to understand. So we have just a few key points before you hear uh, from our panelists. The first is that, you know, the, the point of tonight is that before we act, everybody wants to act and we do too, but before we do that, we need to listen. We really need to listen to what our young people are telling us and to what those who work most closely with them uh, have to say about what they're feeling and thinking and how they're continuing to process May 14th and also the issues uh, that uh, were so involved in, in that terrible day. This is not a scripted conversation at all. They uh, did receive the questions in advance so they could think about them a little bit but we have no idea what they're going to say. So this is a, we want this to be a very, very honest dialogue. Uh, the respondents will then be able to comment on anything that they'd like uh, and certainly join in the conversation when they uh, feel motivated to. And again, the point here is that authentic dialogue can lead to meaningful action. Okay, so I'm going to um, introduce our panelists. Um, and like Dr. G said, this is not scripted. Uh, we want this to be very organic. Um, we just, we want them to feel free and comfortable to say whatever um, is on their hearts. And so, um, I don't think we're in order. No, we're not in order, good. Um, <laughs> so we have uh, Mia Ayers-Goss, um, the Executive Director of Most Valuable Parents, also known as MVP. Um, Emmanuel Wright, he is a senior at Madai University. Stanley Simmons, uh, Say Yes Coordinator at Buffalo State College. And Zariah Scott. And Zariah is a student at Buffalo State. We also have Desmond Randall, who is our athletic director and head men's basketball coach here at Villa. Uh, Janae Brown, a senior in psychology at Villa. Shara Armprester, a career coach at Say Yes Buffalo. And Abu Jallo, a junior at Olmsted High School. So before we even ask them a question, can we get a round of applause? Because it takes guts to do what they're doing. Okay, we're ready to go? <laughs> we're okay. ready. All right, so let's begin. So uh, we're going to start with an easy question, uh, but I think it should elicit some complex responses. This is for anyone who'd like to respond first. Can you tell us how you're feeling? We're about a month and a half into the, the academic year. Uh, how are you feeling as we've uh, embarked on this new academic year? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I'm just testing the mic first. <clears throat> um, I would say, um, though May 14th was uh, a tragedy, um, I think it's important as a community that we look forward. Uh, I feel as though for educators, it's important that you not only teach the curriculum you're supposed to teach, but also make sure it's transparent and not only teaches uh, the importance of demolishing white nationalism, but also erasing other uh, forms of oppression, such as uh, you know misogyny, um, such as work discrimination, and everything like that. I feel as though it's important that us as a community that we kind of uh, look forward and gather together, 
And uh, it's unfortunate that a situation like May 14th causes us to kind of be aware, but you know, it's an unfortunate wake up call and we have to make sure that all the lives that were lost uh, were not lost in vain. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to answer that question? I'm feeling hopeful about this year. I work with the Modern Youth Apprenticeship Program at SAS Buffalo, so we have an opportunity where students can actually work and go to school and bring light to what need they need to do to make that next step in their life. They get the opportunity to be great and work with different employers and work in career jobs. So I think I feel very grateful for that opportunity to be presented in Buffalo, New York, and also hopeful that students will go on to this youth apprenticeship program and be very successful. I also feel encouraged. Um, I'm not a student, but I work with many students and parents. Um, and conversations like these are very, very important. Um, like the gentleman said, it's unfortunate that this situation um, has happened. Um, however, we do need to take advantage of this time to try and heal and move forward. We've had many uh, MVP, we've had many forums and healing circles, and so has a lot of other organizations. So the conversation is being started. So I am very encouraged because of conversations like these. Hmm. Yeah, um, I would say I, I'm feeling encouraged as well. Um, we've had a we've had a long, tough last three three and a half years, and um, you know there's a time where we couldn't do this, right? The world was shut down, and we couldn't come together. Um, and talk about these issues in person and have these conversations in person. Um, and, and these issues were still going on, you know, while, while, you know, we were shut down and there was not much we can do, you know, physically or in person or together, um, you know, but now, now we have, you know, somewhat of, you know, how we operated back going and now we can put things like, to get, like this together and, and bring these conversations, you know, to life and, and really begin to, to make change. Anyone else? No? Okay, so another question that kind of piggybacks off of that is, what, has anything changed for you since May 14th, um, as far as your education is concerned? I know, um, obviously, for Zaire, you know, him, when May 14th happened, him deciding to, you know, go back to school or not, you know, it, it, it's been hard for him, right? He's like, I don't, he doesn't want to go anywhere, right? And I think that that's like a collective feeling of a lot of people in the community. So as students, um, especially, um, or those who work closely with students, do you feel that that's, you know, kind of the standard for students? At least for me, the way that May 14th affected me was I actually live around the corner from the tops that it happened at. So for me, it, fect, it affected me in a way where I wasn't sure if I should leave the house and go to school. And that was mainly everything that I could focus on. And I also do appreciate all the help that we got because that definitely helped me like feel a little more safe as there was a lot more like police activity and there weren't like any worries that it was going to happen again for me at least. That's how it's affected me. But after, I feel like a lot more safe and that I can just focus on school now. And Zariah is actually a student of mine and um, a lot of students have expressed to me that what happened at TOPS actually helped them to really deeply appreciate the things that have already been in place, like visits to my office or, um, you know, the different support systems that are at uh, Buffalo State, which is where I work, um, that they, they found the taking refuge in these spaces to mean a lot more than it did even the Friday before this incident. Um, so it really helped them to to really deepen their understanding of why we do what we do and why relationships with each other is so important. Thank you. Any other? Janae? Go ahead. Um, 
May 14th has uh, changed a lot for me, a lot. Um, unfortunately, I was there at the time of the incident and um, how I approach situations is with a lot more cautious, um, caution. And um, as far as the school year goes, I feel like like you said, Desmond, it's more support, it's more compassion, it's, I'm happy to touch you, we don't have masks on. Um, at Villa, even not knowing the situation that I've been through, our community is really supportive and um, motivating and encouraging. And um, I feel like since that day, we as a community have come together. We should have, like we have, sh we should have done it prior to, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But to see the community as a whole support each other and all the donations is, is beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Any other students? How, how has it changed or has it changed at all how you think about or are approaching your education, Abu? Um, this event. This tragic event that happened really changed the way, like, how I view who I am as a person because, like Zariah said, we go to the tops on Jefferson very frequently, me and my family, and it just scares me that could have been my dad or me or one of my brothers that got in shot, but thank God it wasn't. But it ultimately, you know, gave me hope that as the unification of the community came together through donations and stuff like that. It really brought hope and like light at the end of the tunnel that things are gonna get eventually better. Thank you. Do any of the staff members, any other staff members want to weigh in on that? Have you noticed a change in your students? Have you approached your jobs differently in any way? I think when approaching your job, you have to approach your job with care. Um, I used to work before this at Say Yes as a role as an FSS, and I had one of the parents that I work with reach out to me randomly, and she needed support because her aunt got killed in the tragedy. And she says, I still go and visit it. I still go there and just view like the pictures of her. I can't physically touch her, but people don't understand we're only five months post this event. So being that we're only five months post event, she's still seeking support from her old sources of support. So there are still families out there that's in need. And I think sometimes we don't look at that. So we want life to continue how life once was and it's not like this is still our community and we're still affected by these things but we're not looking at the bigger effect of what that action caused there are still people that are suffering in silence there are still people who don't know that they can reach out to somebody that are just reaching in their hat of who helped me before and how can they help me now because they want this thing to be over but when you deal with those stages of grief is it ever really over or is a next event there that causes us to forget about May 14th and just keep going and keep going and keep going I don't think I approach my job the same I have to just like I said approach with caution and care because I don't know the students and the families that have been affected by this tragic event thank you um, and so while we're talking about institutions, um, so, you know, the faculty um, that is here up here, so, and the students, I think the students can weigh in on this as well. How would you like to see institutions perform differently after 514? Like, what changes do you think need to be made um, administratively or with classes or whatever? I don't know. What, what changes would you like to see? Um, I would say um, <clears throat> the changes that I would like to see is I feel as though schools should prioritize uh, teaching the younger generation about uh, race or about gender or anything like that. I feel as though the content that you find in higher education should be accessible to all ages. I feel as though I shouldn't um, you know, 
I shouldn't wait to learn about the truth about racism once I get to undergrad. I feel as though the concept of racism, the concept of misogyny, the concept of white nationalism should be taught as small as the age of 12 uh, with along, alongside fundamentals as well. Uh, I would like to give credit to my institution for doing a great job, uh, especially professors such as uh, Kevin Clark, uh, Jowsey, and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, if it's good, I feel as though it can get even better. So um, unfortunately, like I said previously, uh, May 14th is a wake up call that we should you know, continuously teach our students and, uh, about the issues that arise after May 14th because they aren't just students now, but they're the future of this nation. And my younger brother is the future of this nation, and my friend's younger brother is the future of this generation. So yeah, we should start early so it's not too late. Thank you, Manny. Uh, th that's a really interesting perspective. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear from some other people too about, and it could be just things that are happening throughout the year. Um, part of the reason we did this is because of the feeling that we can't just act like everything's normal in, in the academic year. And I think as an administrator, you know, one of our, my challenges is to figure out, okay, well then what do we do? You know, what is, it, what is an appropriate response here at Villa or at any educational institution? And there are deep things we could do. We're gonna get into a couple of questions about curriculum. But um, are there other things that come to mind for any of you on the panel about what kinds of things we should be thinking about doing uh, in education as we move throughout the year that helps us continue to heal and respond to the, the shooting? I would just like to say that I would like to see more uh, regularly uh, scheduled healing circles, restorative circles. Uh, when I say healing circles, I mean like restorative practice, uh, forums, regularly scheduled forums with small groups of students to get their perspective and get their feelings and understand, you know, where, where are you right now? How do you feel right now? Giving them a safe space. Um, and just to piggyback on what the young man said, uh, education is key. Uh, the more people are educated on the contributions of black people and they understand you know, that we are not what they thought we were or what maybe they were taught from home. If they learn the truth about what we really are, maybe they won't have so much hatred in their heart. So education is key. So having more black education, African education, you know, just more multicultural education in the curriculum is key. But in, his, in, um, in addition to that, making sure that on a regular basis in small intimate settings that the students are able to feel like they can be themselves and talk about what they're going through, how they feel, and then maybe they can get a different perspective from another student, you know what I mean? So just having more circles, forums, and ways for children, not children, but young adults to speak to one another, I think that would be very helpful. Um, just to reinforce what Ms. Goss said, um, these tough conversations aren't had. Um, when it comes to trauma and tragedy, we tend to shy away from it. And knowledge and being aware is the first step in making a difference. Because if you don't know, then who can help? So I feel like when it comes to our schools and our colleges, um, we need to be trained more so in trauma counseling. We need people to facilitate that, that look like us, that are diverse and can understand. We also need, um, um, I lost my train of thought. It's okay, take your time. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Take your time. It's okay. It'll come back. It sure will. It sure will. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need healing circles. We also need, um, Mental health 
needs to be a, another Absolutely. awareness. That's yes. what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. that, we need mental health days. We need to be, as well as sickness and COVID, as well as, um, you know, other emergencies that you take off for, mental health needs to be just as reinforced as that. Because there are days when people aren't feeling up to par that they do need to take time off for themselves. So that's what I feel like the school could reinforce is our mental health is important because if we're not thinking straight, it's hard to educate and be productive. Thank you for that. Thank you um, to our panelists. Um, we're gonna take a quick break uh, with our asking questions to our panelists and we're gonna bring in our respondents um, and let them um, kind of give their thoughts on some of the things that the students and some of the faculty here, um, and I'm gonna just let it be open and anyone who wants to comment um, on some of the things that they've said so far. Well, one of the things that um, I heard was concerns about safety. And I think that whenever an episode occurs as horrific as uh, May 14th, it really triggers um, a sense of safety, not just for now, but for, for many, many, many years in the future. And so I, I really appreciate um, those who are bringing forth the issue of safety. It is certainly something that we think a lot about on college campuses. Uh, both providing um, a safe environment, but also an opportunity for people to speak to any issue of safety that they're experiencing. Um, traumatic experiences, you're never really quite over with them. You know, they come back often in unexpected ways. And so um, just a minor safety episode can trigger uh, what it was like on May 14th, what you saw, what you experienced, what you heard, the conversation you had. And so I guess one of the things that I'm really thinking about and, and really, um, you know, uh, very glad that people put on the table was the issue and the importance of us all to think about what it takes to have a safe environment and how that we have to continue to work on it because you never know when it's triggered again. So, so that's one of the things on my mind. Thank you. You can pull it. Oh, not that way. Just pull it out. Yeah, that's fine. There you go. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Shala Ahmad, and I'm a geriatric and family medicine physician at the Community Health Center of Buffalo. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And I have to say, just hearing your guys' thoughts, my heart is so heavy and there's just so much that I feel like I can say. I'm just gonna try to keep it really short, but one of the things that I heard from you guys was mental health, trauma, PTSD. And I agree with you, this is not something that you just deal with in a moment of time. This is something that is continuous, it's chronic, and it has to be dealt with um, on a consistent basis. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, I work at the Community Health Center of Buffalo and I've been there for five years and I've been very privileged to work with the patients there. What's very unique about the Community Health Center of Buffalo is we cater to um, a population, an underserved population, and the hardest hit zip codes uh, in Buffalo. And patients come to see us regardless of their ability to pay. And I have to say, it disheartens me to see that some of these patients have not sought care in over five to 10 years, even longer, and are chronically ill, have multiple complexities. And what really disheartens me is a lot of their barriers to healthcare, amongst the many that we know, include mistrust, fear, and then just lack of education in terms of what resources are present to them. So when, when we heard about the Buffalo mass shooting and the news spread, it was very clear to me and to us in our center that Patients were just not gonna walk through our door. Like that was just not gonna happen. And that we needed to make an effort to go out into the community and bring those resources forth to the patients. This was a premeditated act of just violence and pure evil, hatred, uh, that hit on a very different level. We, we talk about post-traumatic stress. We talk about PTSD. Multiple times I feel like we, 
we don't coin that term pro properly because there's PTSD and then there's complex PTSD. And complex PTSD, the biggest difference with that is that PTSD is just a moment in time where somebody has, you know, been affected by a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events in a period of time and that time passes and then they have the sequelae of that. But complex PTSD is a, cr a constant state of fear, living in a constant state of fear. And my patients have told me that. They're afraid to leave their homes. They've become isolated. They, they, can't, they can't go out into the community. They can't go grocery shopping without watching over their backs. It's a constant state of fear. And we know that psychological trauma, emotional trauma eventually translates into chronic illnesses, chronic diseases. So I agree with you guys, the resources need to be there. Those channels need to be there. But like Dr. G was saying, more than acting, the first or the fundamental step is creating that channel of trust. People will not ask for help if they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the Community Health Center of Buffalo put together a team with Dr. Ansari, our CEO, our CMO, Dr. Davis, myself, we had nurses, we had MAs, we had counselors, we had care coordinators who literally went in the community every day, hours, days, whatever was needed to provide resources. And once that connection was made, then that continuity of care could exist. But you can't have continuity of care without trust, persistence, and patience. And so I'm glad we were able to do that for the community, but that's something I believe that needs to continue. I too want to thank Villa Maria College for hosting this very important discussion. And like my fellow responders, I heard a lot of the same things. Uh, trauma, uh, the act of domestic terrorism on May 14th traumatized many people in the community. In the community surrounding the tops on Jefferson Avenue, uh, it was trauma on top of trauma. Many people in that community already were dealing with trauma, feelings of, of trauma, feelings of having been discriminated against. So when you layer trauma on top of trauma, where does that go? Where, where, where does that pain escape? You talked about the importance of uh, mental health availability uh, for people throughout the community. Talked about uh, healing circles, uh, facilitated discussions where people at, uh, in different institutions, colleges, universities, can have these discussions. The critical importance of education. This attack was a racially motivated attack. And the person that committed this terrible act wanted to kill as many black people as they possibly could. The interesting thing is this caused trauma for black people all over the country. Since May 14th, I've uh, been at mayoral conferences, I've been uh, to the White House a number of times for discussions, been with Zanetta Everhart uh, in Washington, been in New York City, and I've heard from a lot of black people from different parts of the country that they felt that this was not just an attack on black buffalo, it was an attack on black America. So people in many places across this country feel a sense of, of trauma and pain and, and loss. But even with all of that, I heard some of you say that you were hopeful for change, that you were optimistic about the future and you felt lifted up by how the community came together, how the community supported each other, how people from many different parts of the community lifted each other up and supported each other in this difficult, difficult situation. It makes me think of how can we keep that going? You know, how can we keep lifting each other up 
you know, across race, across gender, across geography, East Buffalo, North Buffalo, South Buffalo, West Buffalo, uh, su suburbs, urban community. It's important that the community not separate now that it has come together around this horrific incident. I would also say that diversity, equity, and inclusion can't just be terms that we throw out. They, they have to be real. Um, I want to use David Rust as an example with Say Yes Buffalo very early on in the formation of Say Yes when uh, David was hired as the president, one of the questions that I asked David was, is your staff going to look like the community? Is your staff going to look like the young people in the Buffalo public schools uh, and the charter schools that you're trying to help achieve, that you're trying to get from high school to college? And he said, I'm committed to that. I will do that. If you look at Say Yes Buffalo, Say Yes looks like the community. And one of the things that was said is the importance of cultural competency. People that can reach into the community and work with the community that look like people who are hurting, that look like people in different parts of the community. Well, Say Yes is the example of an organization that has done that. I've gone to many organizations in this community, in the city and in the region that don't look like the entire community. And I think all of us have to try to change that. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanna um, thank you, Mayor, um, for your leadership. Um, for, for all of us and for the city of Buffalo um, following the events of 514. Um, I think that your response um, to what happened that day um, has pulled us through this and I'm extremely grateful to you for that. Um, so thank you. Thank you and I agree and there's a lot of great points that were just made and I'd like to shift it back over to our our panel over here and pick up on some of what was just said, you know, so we're talking about the, the continuing trauma, the feelings of safety, um, but that, that spirit of optimism that you expressed and to the mayor's point of how we can continue to make sure we build on that. And um, Emmanuel, you know, you brought up earlier the fact that it wasn't until college, you know, that you learned a, a lot of things about race, about gender, um, and I'd love to hear people's perspective about, you know, really as we dig down into like the, the thing we do in education, the actual teaching that we do, how have we failed to address, to teach, to help our students learn about African American history and culture, about um, white supremacy, about the history of our community, um, where, I'm curious, you know, if anyone wants to speak on that, how do you think we're doing those things well, and where do you see that, you know, we have, we're failing um, to really uh, educate uh, the, the next generation of leaders, as you said? Um, <clears throat> well, I haven't, uh, well, first I'll speak on what, uh, you know, the community is doing well in terms of educators. Um, for my institution, I feel as though many of the professors in the social science department are very transparent about the things that they teach. Um, some professors start off classes with just, you know, um, mantras that really speak to all students. Um, you know, sometimes they challenge students who may uh, not challenge them in like a, a bullying way, but challenge them in terms of why do you have this perspective? What, is, uh, what does it come from? Um, and you know, they, they offer very critical uh, assignments that test students uh, every time they step into the class. Um, 
In terms of uh, what the community doesn't do well, um, I would definitely echo uh, what I said previously. Um, it took a lot of years for me to learn about race. Uh, my fifth grade teacher, he was the first person to kind of introduce it to me, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. Um, Mr. Lyons, I, don't know, I, don't know, I haven't seen him in years, but Mr. Lyons, I remember he used to show me uh, videos of what actually happened to Native Americans because during that era, it was really, we just learned about you know, Columbus and everything like that. But he went against curriculum and he taught us everything that we needed to know. Uh, I would like to give you know, credit to uh, teachers such as Mr. Bennis from uh, my high school, McKinley. He did the same thing. But it shouldn't take uh, teachers and professors going against the curriculum and going against status quo for us to learn what we need to learn. I feel like these things should be implemented. I feel as though we should follow, um, you know, possibly follow other models in different countries or different uh, uh, districts or different states who, who make it a mission to teach their students not only the fundamentals but critical education that, um, that shows the faces of everyone uh, uh, despite uh, race, gender, or anything of that matter. So uh, in conclusion, um, presently my professors do a good job but unfortunately, it took too long, and in addition, it should uh, happen sooner. If I could say something, uh, great, um, great ideas, uh, Emmanuel. Um, we are what we consume, right? No matter if we're listening to it, if, we, if we're uh, watching it, we are what we consume. I believe that um, and this triggered me what you said uh, to think of this. Um, options are some of the best things that you can give to really anyone, but any student. We have seven plus billion people on the planet. That's a lot of ideas, a lot of things to um, uh, discuss, a lot of things to uh, pull from. Um, I have at Buffalo State College through this uh, Say Yes department, we have a Summer Success Academy. And one of the things that I really pride myself, the staff, and the teachers that I have teaching it is that we try to open up the world to every student, encourage them to think critically, constructively, and creatively with all types of information. Uh, we never lie to the students, ever. We want them to hear, we want them to see, we want them to feel, we want them to come to their own conclusions. Our jobs is to encourage them to open their minds and experience. Find out how other people have, you know, got through similar situations that we may be in. Um, learn from each other. Um, you know, as the mayor mentioned, you know, when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we want to encourage them to take, to, to even think in a diverse way, just not how we look, how we walk, how we talk, you know, these types of things, but also the way that we think, have a, um, you know, encourage them to just really reach, especially right now. One of the things that, um, a question I would like to go back to, um, and I think you answered it with um, circles and opportunities for groups of people to uh, come together. Earlier I wanted to say that's what I mean when I say what we consume. We must give everyone, not only students, but ourselves, the opportunity to ingest something else, more positive, you know, ideas and experiences that we get from uh, each other. Not just those who look like us, or think like us, or pray like us, or, or um, you know, share the same language, but mix this together and see what are the common grounds in a safe place, and I think that's what you meant when you were talking about, you know, like the peace circles and such, um, and obviously, and then hope for the best, of course, but they must be introduced to all of the options that are out there that will encourage them to, again, think critically, creatively, and constructively. Um, yeah, um, you know, one, one thing that, that I like that um, Emmanuel said and that stuck out to me is uh, when he spoke of his teachers going against the curriculum. Um, I think oftentimes as educators and, and in the school system, we get so caught up in just teaching the curriculum, um, teaching what we've done, 
for years and years and teaching the norm and making sure our students, you know, learn what we have and what we want to teach them and what we believe, you know, they should be learning what, what we should teach. I think um, I want us to get better at, you know, continuing the conversation of asking them, you know, what they want to learn and how they want to learn. Um, you know, often the, the, the best way to teach and inform and, and educate our, our students is knowing what they want to know. You know, what, what, do you, what do you guys want to know? What do you guys want to learn? And what's the best way for us to teach you, you know, what you're looking for and what you're learning? Um, you know, and like he said, it shouldn't take, you know, his, his two teachers to go against the curriculum for that. Um, let's start opening up the conversation, you know, about, you know, what, what these students, what they want to learn and, and how they want to learn it. And I think we'll get a good grasp on, you know, being able to educate them and being able to teach them things that they feel is meaningful and, and significant. Um, I would say I am a product of the Buffalo Public School System, and I didn't, going through elementary school and high school, know anything about racism other than slavery, and that's something that we as a people went through. I wasn't introduced to the concept of racism until I went to Buffalo State College, and it was a professor, Ron Storr, who talked in sociology about what racism is and how it affects us as a whole and socially but I wasn't educated on what racism truly is and what racial equity looks like until I went to say as Buffalo as an employee, um, Tommy McLean runs our racial equity program along with Tyan Staples and Carrie Cunningham. And these people came together and created a circle that taught us what these concepts really meant. What is microaggressions? What is macroaggressions? What is white privilege? And although I was in my late 20s learning these things, it was something I became invested in because it was something that nobody had ever taught me. So it caused me to join the Racial Equity Board at Say Yes and understand the importance of pushing into different spaces to talk about what it really means. Um, when you look at Say Yes as a whole, we talk and we, we explore mental health. We try to remove barriers from every, uh, every aspect. We have our health homes program. We have our family support specialists. We have the Boys and Men of Color program. And we have that as part of our statement and our motto, um, this racial equity and inclusion thing. And a lot of people in different organizations don't host that. So pushing and allowing us to come into different spaces has been pivotal in Buffalo and pivotal in our education system because I'm now seeing kids actually ask us questions about what does this mean, what does that mean, and we have people on these different committees and people in these different spaces that can now explain to students what it really means. So I think what we need now is not a pushback and really understand that this is here. This is something that has always been here, but now we have these students who are on social media and they have the world at their fingertips so they can look up and they have to ask us questions. What does this mean? What does that mean? We need people educated on how to answer these students correctly and Say Yes has given not only me as a employee, but me as a person some of those answers. And I think we just need to keep pushing that model into different spaces, into different organizations, so we can understand what racial equity and inclusion really looks like. Thank you. I, I have some follow-ups, but does anyone else? In, in our current, yeah, Abu, please. As, as Mr. Wright was saying, it shouldn't take teachers to go out of their way to teach us by the curriculum, because as being a junior in high school, I was able to endure like the challenges of going by the book, learning like mostly about slavery and stuff like that. But fortunately, I was able to have parents that embedded in me at a young age about racism and about how what truly what truly the world is, what it is, and that ultimately, I feel like we should start implementing race and stuff like this because it shouldn't take a shooting to occur for us to finally realize that. I'm a target. I'm a young 17-year-old black boy that's going to be a target anywhere I go, but I won't unfortunately realize that until I'm in college or until I have kids or stuff like that. But I feel like it should be implemented into like our curriculum as like BPS students and stuff like that. That like what that gentleman said over there, like we acts as what we want to learn because I'm 
at this point getting fed up of like sitting here learning about stuff that already happened in the past when there's stuff right now that we can change and hopefully prevent in the future. Thank you, Abu. Uh, and you know, I often use the example, my daughter is a sophomore in high school right now. And you know, it's great that she's learning about 16th century France, but I don't know what she's learning about, <laughs> about our community, about Buffalo, about our history, about racism, about anything related to our collective history um, beyond a little bit about slavery, the Civil War, and, the, and a very sanitized version of the Civil Rights Movement. So I'm, I'm going to go rogue for a minute and swing a question <laughs> over to Mayor Brown and to Dr. Conway Turner because as soon as educators start talking about let's do more of this in our curriculum, things become politicized very, very, very quickly. So I'm wondering, from your perspectives, how you think we can manage and cut through some of the immediately people will be, you know, you're teaching critical race theory, it's got to get out. And um, I think in particular in our suburban communities and in our white communities, there are real challenges to trying to embed more honest history about racism and lived experience um, related to racism in our curriculum. So I'm just wondering if either one of you would want to comment on the politicization that education faces. Well, you certainly hit on a really important issue. Um, many people feel that making someone uncomfortable is not a good thing. And so therefore, let's don't talk about the reality of uh, racism, sexism, discrimination, because perhaps somebody might be a bit uncomfortable. And so to me, that undergrids the political dynamic that you're talking about. And that we're seeing across this country a number of states that are trying to regulate what our young people learn in their classrooms beyond the fact that you have a certain curriculum, but really not to challenge or make people a bit under, uncomfortable to understand the reality of what's going on. I feel that it's important both to know the history of the experiences that have happened and that the foundation of this country, which has many strains of genocide, racism, sexism, et cetera, for across a number of people, that it's important to understand that in order not to replicate that in the future. But it is also important to understand the contemporary ways that discrimination continues to manifest itself. And so it's not enough to really know the history of 1865 or 1900, but what are the current manifestations of the evil that we saw early on that some people don't even want to talk about the past. So certainly don't, they don't want to embrace the current future the curtain present. So it is a very uh, big hot button, uh, you know, and depending on where you live in this country, it's a bigger hot button. Um, Buffalo State is an urban engaged campus and we do a lot in the community. And we belong to an organization that really talks about civic engagement in our communities across the country. And some of my colleagues in some of the states really say that they cannot even give voice to these important issues without having real serious uh, consequences for their campuses. And so it has been politicized in a way that dis does not serve our students, our families, or our communities across this, this country. Um, but I also wanted to speak a little bit to what um, someone said about um, when you need to give voice in a particular class. In a college environment, when students come into your class, and it has just been May 14, there is nothing more important than to talk about what happened on that day. I don't care if your topic is biology, math mathematics, English, there is nothing more important than that topic on that day and the subsequent days. But I would say that it shouldn't just be a college experience to have that flexibility, it should be throughout K through 12. When students come in 
and they are hurting and there's pain and they're feeling unsafe, then we've got to create the kind of environment that we talk about and work on the issue that's present today, not the all-important lesson number 1.7 that talks about whatever you're, you're studying. And so I think we have to, as a, you know, uh, P through, you know, 16 community, really understand that importance. You know, that sometimes it's nothing more important than stopping and having that really rich conversation now because the consequence of not having that, con that conversation can really be problematic for the individual and the community. And then I also want to speak to the perpetrator of the horrific crime that happened on May the 14th. He was only 18 years old. So what school was he in and what was he learning and how did he fester the hatred that was so deep that at 18 years old, he comes and does such a horrific act? So we might say, well, if he was 40, this might have happened to him and you know, he was inculcated with this that, and the other. This was an 18 year old. So it really says that our school systems have to do something different than what we're doing now to seed the right way of thinking about how we're all in this together and not the racism and sexism and discrimination that seems to be able to take hold and fester in our communities. The politicization of education in America is a real danger to our nation. And there are some people that don't want to teach history because it makes them uncomfortable. Uh, but real history is, is fact. Uh, in, in East Buffalo, uh, some folks call it his story because it's his story, <laughs> meaning that it's not real history, it's what they want you to know. It's what a certain group of individuals want you to know because if you are taught the real history of, of things, maybe you'll have a different perspective. Maybe you'll vote a different way. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Conway Turner said, many places in this country almost forbid the reading of certain books. Uh, they forbid uh, the teaching of uh, true history uh, because they don't want people to have information. Uh, knowledge is, is power and having real information causes us to make different decisions. But I think with the politicization of education we are all at risk. We are all in a dangerous situation because there are politicians that do not want educators to be able to give people accurate, factual information because it would alter the political dynamics and that is a very, very sad thing and a very dangerous thing for all of us and for this entire nation. Senator Kennedy, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Brown. You came at the perfect moment. We started talking about the politicization of education. So I would love to get your input on, um, you know, our panel was saying it would be uh, very beneficial if at an earlier age, college is too late, at an earlier age, our young people are really learning more about the true history of our country, of our community, of race, and of racism, but that often becomes so politicized and so, that, that it, the, the, it just stalls and nothing actually changes in the curriculum. So the question um, was about, you know, any thoughts you have about that and how do we even begin to try to overcome that, that stalemate that we seem to be in? Well, thank you, Dr. G. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Zanetta Everhart, uh, an extraordinary leader in our community. Uh, to my colleagues, um, Dr. Catherine Conway-Turner, to Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown and I just left 
uh, the Jesse Ketchum Award Ceremony over at West Hurdle Academy. Uh, so forgive me for my tardiness. Uh, Dr. G would send me to detention if I were going here to Villa Maria College. <laughs> but uh, my daughter, uh, who's a uh, freshman over at City Honors just last year as her eighth grade class, she uh, was the valedictorian of her class. So she received the Jesse Ketchum Award tonight. So as a father, I had to be there. So forgive me for uh, showing up a little late. That, that, that show is still going on. The mayor was kind enough to show up and meet with the group along with Superintendent Williams. And so it's a fitting question uh, about education and diversity. It's a very diverse group uh, that received the Jesse Ketchum Awards from all over the city of Buffalo. One of the um, uh, parts of the ceremony was a uh, conversation about the history of the award, which is 151 years old this year. It's the only school system in America that does this uh, award. And uh, it, it talked about the first uh, recipient of the Jesse Ketchum Award of Color was in 1872, which, do the math, 150 years ago uh, this year, uh, it was also uh, a year after uh, the city of Buffalo schools were desegregated. And uh, you think about the sad history of our country and the torturous history that we are all dealing with and continue to pull ourselves out of. Uh, and when I'm at an event like that and I'm reminded of uh, you know, how far we've come as a nation, but how much more work we need to do. And May 14th was a, another sad reminder of the work that needs to be done. We have to dig ourselves out of a horrific history. And as far as I'm concerned, it begins and ends with education. Um, if you go back to 1845, when Frederick Douglass wrote his autobiography, uh, his focus uh, as an escaped slave that became, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest American heroes ever to live, uh, Frederick Douglass talked about the value of education, the importance of education, the way out of poverty and the way to a new life and to the American dream of education, and how our country and the laws uh, that had been instituted uh, kept people of color down because of a lack of uh, their ability to receive that education. Uh, it is so important that we focus on education of our youth, uh, on education policy, on diversity of education. You know, one of the greatest moments that uh, I've had this year uh, was just standing here this past Saturday with Zanetta, with Dr. G, and a group of leaders, about 40 volunteers that came out to stack the bookshelves with all of the books, tens of thousands of books that were donated from all across the globe. And an initiative that Zanetta and her son, Zaire, put together to focus on diversity of education of our youth and what they're learning about the history of this nation, where we are, where we're headed, and really the work that needs to be done. So I think the value begins in the classroom, and it starts with us. Whether we have children in school or not, I happen to have three that are being taught right now in the Buffalo Public Schools that are coming up, 17, 14, and 11, very informative years. So I'm living this life as a father, as I mentioned earlier, but whether we have children in school or grandkids in school or not, we can play a significant role by using our voice to have an impact on the policy, and in this case, the diversity of the policy in education. And I'm excited about where we're at uh, as a community in education. I'm excited about our new superintendent of the Buffalo Public Schools, Dr. Tanja Williams who I think is a visionary and has been embraced by the leadership in the schools and the parents. And uh, we recognize that there's a lot of work to do, but uh, it starts with uh, all of us playing that role in that diversity of education. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely, um, that, was, that was awesome. Thank you, Dr. G, for that 
question posing that this way. And I actually want to take it back this way because I, like some of you, um, I didn't learn about a lot about African American history until I went to college. Um, and that was here at Villa Maria. I'm a graduate of Villa Maria College. Um, Dr. G um, was one of my professors when I was here. Um, and one of the classes that he taught was African American literature. Um, and I took that class and it was life changing for me. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, my experience is exactly you know the experience that um, a lot of you faced, and I want to get just a little bit deeper. I know we're we're um, dwindling down on our time, um, but I think that this is something that I think we we need to hear from from the students, and and I want to hear about your experiences personally with racism. Have you experienced racism? Has it, and and if you have experienced it, how has it? shaped your vision of the world we live in? Anyone? Um, so I have personally experienced racism in both Buffalo and on various types of media. I've experienced racism in Buffalo by like being followed if I go to a store to see if I'm not stealing anything, or somebody moving to the other side of the sidewalk because I made them uncomfortable by just being black or like walking towards them. And that's not something that I'd want to like have any other person of color experience because it's not a very fun thing to go through. Um, other ways I've experienced racism, racism on social media is by having like random people that you have no clue who they are or how they are as a person just say really mean things to you. And the best you can do is either report them or just ignore it and continue on, which doesn't really help that much. But as long as you can like get past that and see if there's something that can make you feel better, usually you can feel better in the end, even if that negative feeling hurt you a lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think, you know, race racism for me, um, I think it's very, very complex. Um, I think it's more complex than we oftentimes um, acknowledge. Um, I mean, it, there's oftentimes who, you know, people who may not believe they're racist or um, people you know, you know, may not, from what we um, translate to racism, be racist. But I mean, racism can go so far down to just the smallest thoughts and beliefs. Um, and, you know, I, I was someone who, you know, I was born and raised on, um, in Detroit, Michigan, you know, right in the heart of, you know, the east side of Detroit. Um, and then I, I moved here um, to Buffalo, but actually in West Seneca, you know, so I grew up and went to high school in West Seneca. Um, my high school, I was one of probably five, maybe, um, you know, African-American um, students. And, you know, I, I, you know, I had no problem making friends. Um, you know, I was an athlete and, and you know, and didn't really experience what we would consider the um, huge issues of racism, but just growing up in that environment and being there every day, you know, the smallest beliefs that, you know, oftentimes my friends didn't realize they would say to me, um, you know, it, it, was, it was racist thoughts and racist beliefs. Um, you know, just going down to, you know, for me, when, when, when you grew up in that environment, um, you know, things become to influence you, you know, from, so then growing up in, in, in how I talked, you know, people would say, you know, you talk white or you talk proper. Um, and, and that's a racist statement, you know, to believe that the proper way to talk is of white people, you know, that, that black people don't talk correct, They're, they talk a certain way. And I think little, little things like that often go um, un, untalked about or unrecognized as racism. And it's so it's so complex, and you know we can go so far you know into it and deep. And I think we need to have those conversations uh, for us to really you know change and get an understanding of of, of racism. Um, and I think you know I think we all know that that racism can affect how um, you know people people do their jobs. You know, um, and the question is, have you experienced racism? So you know, throughout life, yeah, little things here and there. Uh, for me, the, the, the biggest experience I probably had was um, probably two years ago, um, and it was actually on campus here. It wasn't, 
you know, Villa per se that the racism occurred or anybody from Villa. Um, but, you know, Dr. G and I, you know, we, we, we talk about this and it was, it was something that really um, hit home for, for him and I, um, as well as other faculty. But, um, you know, so, you know, like I'm, I'm the athletic director, head men's basketball coach. Um, I wasn't the athletic director at the time that, that this occurred. Um, but um, because I'm the basketball coach, I do things on the weekends, you know, in, in the facility at our athletic facility down, um, you know, down at the ne um, athletic building. And um, I was there on the weekend. Um, on a Saturday, um, I had just did some in a bas basketball event, uh, just followed up, and uh, it was around that time where they really, they're doing some construction down there now, and they started to kind of clean out the building next door that they're doing, and, um, you know, I was there finishing up, it was day daytime, probably, you know, four, four or five o'clock in the evening, um, shutting the building down, um, I was the only one, you know, in there left, it, you know, 50, 60 people were there at one point, and you know, because I work there, um, you know, we, we don't oftentimes need security because I'm running the building. I'm, you know, I have the ability to run the building. Um, so I'm shutting it down, closing the build, building down. And um, at the time, I just so happened to be on FaceTime with my father, kind of telling him about, you know, the event that I just had and um, turning off all the lights, you know, to the facility and, and everything. And I get to the la the, the breaker box. So I'm, I'm walking down. Always and... Um, I got my phone in one hand because I'm FaceTiming and I, I had brought some lunch because I was in the the whole day. And I had my lunch container and earlier in the day I got coffee. So I had my lunch container, my coffee on top of my lunch container. Um, so as I'm going, I'm talking, I'm turning off lights, my coffee still falls over. Um, so I set everything down and I go get some paper towels to, to clean, up, clean up the coffee. And at this point, all the lights in the building are off. There's, only, there's, a, there's a main hallway um, to our offices. Those, those were the only set of lights still on. And um, I have my, we, we, we've got, you know, we got our main entrance and we got side, side entrances that we can come in, into the building. And the side entrance, you can see the buildings next door that they're working on. Um, so I spilled the coffee right at the end of the hallway and you have, you know, our main main entrance and then the side doors. Um, so I turn my back to the side doors to to wipe up the coffee. And um, as I as I stand up, you know, all I hear is, "What are you doing? You know, what are you doing in here? Who are you? Why are you in the building?" And I turn around, and it's four or five police officers, you know, entering the building, guns drawn. Um, and obviously this is right in the heart of, you know, George Floyd and all the other things that, that took place over the last, you know, three or four years. And immediately, you know, I freeze, put my hands up. Now, mind you, I'm decked out in all Villa gear. I have a Villa hat on, uh, Villa pants, Villa jacket, Villa book bag. And, you know, as, as I turn around, you know, they're asking me these questions and, you know, they, it's dark, so I can only, they can see me, but I can barely see them. And I just see six bodies come in, you know, and I saw guns and then the closest person to me, you know, had a gun right on me. And I just locked in and focused on that gun. You know, first time I've ever been that close with a gun pointed on me. And obviously you can imagine what's going through my mind, you know, don't do anything that they can determine or deem a threat to them and, you know, get shot. Um, so, you know, they, they start to, you know, bark commands and, you know, now I'm just trying to, you know, stay calm, you know, don't show them anything that makes it seem like you're escalating the situation. Um, be very clear and thorough, anything you say back to them. And the first thing that comes to mind is I got my phone in my hand and my phone is an iPhone all black case. So my first thought is I don't want them to think this is, this is a gun. So, you know, I immediately tell them, because they're, they're saying, you know, all right, hands up, don't move, you know, asking who I am, what am I doing? I say, you know, um, I'm, I'm a head basketball coach. I was here for practice. I'm just closing down the building. And they're like, all right, turn around, you know, turn around, get, in, get on the wall. And I'm like, okay, but I have my phone in my hand. What do you want me to do with my phone? You know, and they set it on the ground. So I turn, I turn around, you know, put it on the ground, turn around, get against the wall. And like I said, I'm against the wall, and it says Villa right on my book bag. Clearly, you know, I have reason to be in the building. 
Um, and, you know, they, they come over me, they pat me down, you know, go through my pockets, throw all my stuff on the ground from my pockets, you know, all that. You know, at, at that point, they realize I'm not a threat. You know, they turn me around. They begin to explain, you know, what they were doing, why they were doing there. Um, you know, and, and I'm sharing that story and I relate it to racism because, you know, as Dr. G and I are talking, it's like, well, if that was Dr. G, would they have told him to turn around, get on the wall, pat him down, treat him like he was already a criminal before they even, you know, got ID or anything like that. Um, at the time, our athletic director, um, I was an athletic director, but at the time, our athletic director was, you know, a white lady. And again, if she's in a building by herself, um, turning off the lights, do they come in, guns drawn, and tell her to get a, you know, I think we all could probably answer pretty, you know, Firmly, no, they wouldn't have. Um, and, and again, that's why I say it, it all, it goes as to deep as how people do their jobs. You know, like he said, being followed, or like, like she said, being followed because, you know, of the color of her skin in a store where now she's going to steal something. Um, me going through that because I was an African-American man in, in a building uh, with a book bag on and a hat. And, you know, so... Racism is so complex, and I think oftentimes we don't get peel back enough layers to get to the bottom of what can actually be racism, and I think we really need to start doing that. Thank you, Des, for sharing that uh, with everybody. And uh, yeah, I mean, to the complexity, I personally totally agree. I think we often, and when I say we, I mean, I'll speak as a white male, um, I think a lot of white people often want to simplify it, make it so simple so we can say we're not, or it's, it's not a factor. And that's why these kinds of conversations and why an educational environment is such a fertile ground for these conversations. To, it, it's so important to explore it in all of its complexity because otherwise it just gets so easily politicized and we just say, yes, no, I'm not, you are, critical race theory, blah, 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 and we don't get anywhere as a society. Anyone else want to jump in on, on that or do, do you want to move on to? Yeah, I no, to I want us to get ready to wrap up because we don't want to keep you know, you if here I, if all I night. Could, but just, I want to just give very quickly our on that please, one. respondents a second to. So, you know, li listening to the comments of the Villa Athletic Director, unfortunately, with black people and other people of color, uh, in this community and in communities all across the country, there oftentimes is the presumption that something is wrong or they're doing something that's not right. So black while coaching, black while driving, black while shopping in the store, black while walking down the street, black while mayoring. It, it, it is not uncommon. There is the presumption that these people, they must be doing something wrong. Something is amiss. And so it's not, it's not the same feeling of I believe you that the majority community affords to each other. So the athletic director said, what would be the experience if Dr. G was locking up the gymnasium facility? When the Cheektowaga police come out, is there a different response, a different presumption, a different way they look at the situation? And so that is also a level of trauma that black people and other people of color experience in our community uh, and in our country. Yeah, I wanna give um, each of our respondents, I'm sorry, a, a chance to um, just respond um, about any of this, um, whatever you wanna say um, before we get ready to close out. Dr. Ahmed? Yeah, I just, we talked about a lot of important things and from a medical health perspective, I, I do want to say that 
yes, you know, there was a lot of trauma from this, but with this comes a lot of hope. And I think that, you know, people from all different places with all sorts of resources came together and banded together. I think these conversations need to continue. Uh, I think these conversations are vital for our healing, but there are so many resources in the community and we, we need to make, and we have made those resources available. There's mental health counseling, there's you know um, grief counseling, there's biofeedback, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's so much out there to help people. Nobody should be dealing with depression, anxiety, PTSD, complex PTSD, or you know trauma alone. That is not something that should be dealt with in isolation. And so the dialogue actually really needs to continue. We need to have these conversations. My personal training with just racial inequity and just some of the things that the community faces actually happened when I took my job in Buffalo. I would say close to 80 to 90% of my patients are African Americans, and that's where I learned the most, which was from my patients. And that took a lot of patience and persistence and building that rapport with them and really understanding where they were coming from. I have patients who refuse to go to the emergency department or to seek care because they're afraid of how they're gonna be treated differently. And I mean, that breaks, breaks my heart. And so, like we all talked about, education is vital in this. Opening up the dialogue is vital in this. And I think this incident, as traumatic and tragic as it was, has helped to open up that dialogue and that should continue. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And I just wanna say, um, I think I've spoken on this publicly before, um, but Dr. Ahmed, like she said, she works for the Community Health Center of Buffalo with Dr. Ansari. Um, and I just wanna again thank you um, because two days after um, the tragic shooting, um, Dr. Ansari brought a team of nurses and doctors to my house um, to check on Zaire. Um, and to check on me. And Dr. Ahmed was one of those doctors, so I just wanna say thank you. Um, and for continuing to care for me and Zaire. Um, truly, I thank you. My pleasure. Um, I, I just wanna add to that just another second or so. We, in, in, in our training, like in residency and fellowship, 12 years of practice, are trained to deal with all sorts of trauma and complexities and to keep a calm, patient, steadfast attitude in the face of all of that. Dr. Ansari called me two days later and asked me, our CEO asked me to drop everything and said, you know, we've just got to go to one of the, the survivors or the victims' homes to take care of them. I dropped everything and, and was on my way to Zanetta's home. And the only thought that I had in my mind was, despite all my training, I had no idea what I was walking into. And I knew that when I got there, no matter what the situation was, because it was so fresh, and I had never dealt with a trauma like this before, Not, none of us had. I, I knew that we had to get into the role no matter what that meant. And within 45 minutes to an hour, we had, I had to create that rapport. And to my surprise, it turned out to be a beautiful friendship. So um, some goodness came out of that. And um, I think we were just very fortunate that we could be there in that capacity. Thank you. Dr. Turner? So um, what I'd like to say here at the end is that education um, about racism, uh, justice issues, discrimination is not just important for people of color. It's important for everyone. That when people harbor misunderstandings and stereotypes about black people and brown people, there are microaggressions that happen all the time in their interactions. You heard some of them already today, but when uh, one of my black students walks you know, in a um, store, they don't see them as a student first. They see them as, as Mayor Brown said, as a potential perpetrator. Uh, and so education does not just help those of color to understand who we are and our history and our, the, the current manifestations. It helps everyone fight against the uh, stereotypes that they have uh, been bought, uh, born with, heard when they were growing up, and the things that they harbor. Uh, so it's just very important to understand that education on these issues is really for helping lift the whole community 
and hopefully then not seeing the kind of discrimination that we see in many of our communities today. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Great conversation tonight. I would say another word that I want to leave you with is empathy. Let's, let's put ourselves in each other's shoes and be empathetic toward each other. Uh, one of the things that uh, growing up my family used to say is treat other people the way you want to be treated and treat other people like you would want your family to be treated. That's empathy. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> thank you. And uh, again, I, I want to thank uh, the, the panelists, um, the respondents, our hosts, uh, Phil and Maria College. You know, I want to thank Des for sharing that very personal story. You know, it, it takes guts to share a story like that. Des used to work in my office. Uh, we have a great friendship uh, going back many years. Uh, so I'm not surprised that you shared that. Um, that is a story that can be replicated, I'm sure, unfortunately, uh, many times, probably in this room and uh, unquestionably outside of this room. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, what 514 did is it magnified the work that needs to be done. Uh, the work in many ways we were already uh, getting out in front of. Um, you know, as a state, as a nation, um, we have work to do. As a community, we have work to do. Uh, but you think about how this country was founded, even before this country was founded, 400 plus years ago when the first slave ships came to America, and the plight that people of color, particularly African Americans, but all people of color have had to deal with uh, since then. Um, you know, 200 years ago in the state of New York, it was legal to own another human being. Today, 200 years ago today, not until 1827 um, was it illegal. And we know the story of our nation. We know the story of our state and the horrific fight for justice that ensued over the last couple of hundred years, uh, both the Civil War, post-Civil War, uh, the decisions after the Civil War to create the separation of, uh, you know, blacks and whites in the Deep South perpetuation of what the Civil War was fought to end. Um, the hatred that was perpetuated by Supreme Court decisions that lessened the lives of our fellow Americans, uh, the fights that we continue to have to deal with today. Uh, we know that the Civil Rights Movement was that. It was a movement, uh, and it was a moment in time but we continue to fight those same civil, for those same civil rights today in many different ways, here in our community, here in New York State, and unquestionably across our country. It's essential that we remain engaged, involved, and work to uh, enlighten ourselves through education uh, and enlighten our fellow brothers and sisters uh, through education and engagement. Um, you know, when, when I hear of a story like the one Des just told, uh, it's a very quick reminder of the institutional racism in our country that we have to overcome. And we talk about education. Education is a word, but it's, it's simple. It's enlightenment. And when 514 happens here in Buffalo, here in New York, here in the United States of America, uh, it harkens back to the evils to which this country was founded on and the work that we still need to do to overcome those evils. Uh, it's conversations like this that will help all of us, but what do we do from here? And it's policy, uh, but it's each and every one of us being a part of that policy, being a part of that conversation. Um, focusing on things like uh, creation of the office of uh, uh, social justice and racial equality. A bill that I carry, that uh, Majority Leader People Stokes carried, 
that we passed in the Senate and the Assembly now sits on the governor's desk that we expect the governor to sign, creating a new office here in New York State. Uh, the work that we have to do on uh, giving access to fresh fruits and vegetables and foods in food deserts, not just here in Buffalo. This isn't strictly a Buffalo problem. This is a New York problem. This is a national problem. Uh, Buffalo, I believe, can and will, given the folks that are here today, all of us, uh, serve as a model for the rest of the nation for social justice and racial equality. That's my goal as an elected leader, as a Buffalonian, as a Western New Yorker. And I think that's everybody's goal. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of us working together to get there. And again, uh, I'm just I'm honored to be a part of this uh, conversation tonight. And I thank everybody for helping to make this happen. Thank you, Senator. So Dr. G, what do you think about letting our panelists have the the last word here tonight? I think that's a great idea, but I have to say something first, Absolutely. which is uh, two <laughs> things. One is um, we had a lot of other questions. We knew we weren't going to get through all of them. We, yeah. We had questions about social media, which came up, um, and a variety of other things. And there were some questions from the audience that magically appeared here on the floor next to me um, that we didn't get to. So what that tells me is, to your points, this conversation has to keep going. And I would just, so we're going to do some thinking about what the next steps might be on our end, but I would challenge everybody to go back to your organization, your institution, your family, whoever it is, and have a similar conversation, open up these spaces so that then we can reconvene as a community and really, as you said, be a model for other communities um, in the country and get to that act part. The, we got to listen, learn, and act, get to the act part where we really start to move and make some significant changes. Yeah. So I just, um, I'm a word person. I love words. So um, from each of you, one word that you just want to share, that you're thinking about, that describes what happened here today or what you want to see in the future, or whatever it is, pick a word or a phrase. Uh, for me, I think the word trauma from today um, sticks out for me in, in, you know, in sharing that story and why it has to continue to be talked about. Because the trauma, as much as we can do, you know, it, it either doesn't go away or it takes a, a long time. Um, you know, there's not a day that I shut the building down that I don't think about it, you know, or I look at that door, those doors, and don't, that. I just, that's just something I'm going to ever, forever remember. Um, you know, I'll be able to deal with it, but, you know, trauma, you know, is the one that, that because that's, that's trauma, you know, um, and, and, you know, being, having to be reminded of it every time I turn the lights off and walk towards that door, um, you know, really, that's why we got to continue to have these conversations and have spaces where, you know, we can we can talk about these things. Yeah. Awareness. Awareness would be my word because, um, um, as far as the top shooting, I didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to express how I felt about it. Didn't really want to be there, obviously, and. Um, you can't be helped if no one knows. The community can't be helped if we don't know what the needs are. So awareness, because what we know helps. I would say engage. I would like to see us engage regularly. So engage. Um, mine is hope, because I know a lot of us have a lot of hope that hopefully everything will get better, and I do believe it will get better. Uh, two words for me, I would say uh, mindful consumption. My word is education, like we all stated collectively, especially Senator Kennedy, that we all need to be educated from a young age, not just from college. We just now know this, but like from like as young as we can to inform everybody about the challenges this world has to offer and how we can face them. Um, I would say grateful, and I would say grateful for because we do have the opportunity to come into these spaces and have these conversations and even looking in the audience and seeing so many people that showed up on such a rainy, cloudy day but still made it and pushed through to be here with us to try to make a change and start those conversations about how do we make that change. I'm grateful and hopeful that a change is soon to come. Uh, <clears throat> my word is progress. Uh, I feel as though conversations like these are um, uh, a step in the right direction. Um, 
you know, uh, horror doesn't seem, horror seems fictional until it's staring directly at you. And it's, unf it's unfortunate that uh, those who passed away on May 14th had to experience uh, something so horrifying. But considering that we all are here today and we're all here uh, listening, and hopefully we may make decisions that invest not only in our community, but you know, uh, nationwide, uh, hopefully there will be progress uh, in the near future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.